Hi, my name is Kate Sullivan, and I'm here today to talk about mitochondrial diseases and immunologic function. And I'd already set up my template, so I'm gonna go with the green swirls today. And if you ask any immunologist where mitochondria have their largest effect in the immune system, I think most people would say T cell activation. There's really abundant literature talking about the metabolic switch that's required for T cells to become fully effector cells, as well as memory T cells. And that abundant literature has really spawned a, a really clear and coherent understanding of the role of metabolism in T cell function. Less well understood is the role of the mitochondria in B cells, B cells being responsible for antibody production. And that's actually what I'm gonna end up focusing on because most of the clinical data reflects B cell dysfunction. But I do also wanna mention that the innate immune system is also impacted by mitochondria. And I think that's best exemplified by looking at macrophages. Macrophages really come in two types. The M1 macrophage is responsible for host defense and it relies almost exclusively on glycolysis. Whereas macrophages that are charged with healing are M2 macrophages and they rely on fatty acid oxidation and oxidative phosphorylation. So very different agendas that are completely dependent on that metabolic switch. Well, there are some inborn errors of immunity that are known to be directly as a result of mitochondrial dysfunction. I've listed four here. This is not an exhaustive list. This is just meant to exemplify some different mechanisms, but I would like to highlight that neutropenia often is related to mitochondrial dysfunction and subsequent apoptosis. But these four inborn errors of immunity all affect different aspects of host defense and exemplify different mechanisms. So certainly it's a well-described clinical association. Nevertheless, there had actually been relatively little data on cohorts of patients with mitochondrial disease and their immune system. So about two years ago, the mitochondrial group here invited speakers from NIH to come and there was a talk on immunologic dysfunction. They have not published their work, it's available only as an abstract, but they looked at a cohort of 27 patients, noted that infection is the leading cause of death, and they looked at warning signs for immunodeficiency. Now, these warning signs have been published largely as a public relations effort. They certainly raise awareness of immunodeficiencies, but they've been demonstrated to be neither sensitive nor specific. But look at the high rates. If you just think of these as tick off boxes of things that could relate to immunologic dysfunction, you can see really there's quite a significant signal of infection in their cohort. There's also an abstract from the University of Texas that uh, was at Quad AI a year ago, and they looked at 29 patients. They noted a very high rate of recurrent sinopulmonary infections. About a third of the patients had hypogammaglobulinemia, which is a low IgG, and I'll come back to that when we look at our data. Um, about a 10% rate of vaccine failure and about a 10% rate of sepsis. Well, there's a paucity, therefore, of published literature on mitochondrial diseases and immunologic dysfunction. So I decided to look at our cohort, and I'm going to show you the data. I'm going to say at the outset that um, these data are not perfectly curated. You will see at the end that I do some chart extractions and try and look at a bit more detail. This would need to be cleaned up for publication, but the data is actually fascinating and provocative, and uh, I think the overall um, conclusions are going to hold true. So let me just share with you our data. And of course, it's important to look at the immune system because so many patients have a metabolic crisis when they have infection that the, the magnitude of the problem when they get infection is so much greater than the general population. So if there's anything we can do to prevent or mitigate infections, we certainly want to. So let's take a look at our cohort. You will see ultimately 66 patients that had a full immunologic evaluation. I'm gonna start with just neutrophils and lymphocytes, which is a much larger um, set of numbers to look at. And you're going to see multiple graphs that are set up this way. So let me just orient you to how it's set up. So uh, on the x-axis, there are four age bins. So many immunologic parameters vary quite a bit according to age. So you will notice the four distinct age bins. And then the brackets that I have drawn in represent the normal range. So if we look at the neutrophil count, you will notice that there are some patients with neutropenia, but there's also a few patients that have rather high neutrophil counts. Overall, these violin plots show um, a, a nice distribution that represents roughly the range of the normal range. 
When you look at lymphocyte counts, it's actually a little bit different. So there's far more patients that are on the low end than on the high end, a suggestion that lymphocyte counts are low overall. But within the lymphocyte count are, of course, many different cell types, all of which have different agendas in the immune system. So let's just look at T cells. So T cells are charged with governance of the immune system and regulation, as well as actual defense of viral infections. So this left-hand panel that says CD3 counts are the total T cells. And you will see, again, a distribution that, if anything, is maybe a bit high, also, although certainly there are individual patients that have low T cells. But when we start to look at the subsets, we see in CD4 cells, there's really nothing that looks out of range. But in CD8 cells, and this is the cell type that's critical for the defense against viral infections. We see low CD8 counts, best visible in that five to 10 year age bracket, um, but certainly a significant number of patients with low CD8 T cells. Well, also in the lymphocyte count is a cell type called a natural killer cell. And natural killer cells do defend against viruses, largely herpes viruses like EBV and CMV, but they seem to have a role in HSV-1, for example, and some other viruses. Now, I always like to explain that natural killer cells are sort of like orchids. So there are lots of low NK cells here, and the NK cell count goes down with stress, with infection, um, they do kind of easily fold up shop and disappear. So these low in K cells could be related to inflammation or medications or metabolic stress. It's really hard to know, but do look at the number of patients that have low in K cells. It's really quite striking. And now what I'm going to really emphasize is the B cells, as I said at the outset. So uh, the B cells ultimately turn into antibody secreting cells, which are termed plasma cells. Plasma cells live in the bone marrow, so they're not accessible by blood drawing. And so I'm going to look at some surrogates of that. So in the left-hand panel, I'm looking at total B cells. And you can see, again, there's quite a range. There's definitely some folks who are quite low. Um, but again, a broad range that includes folks who have high B cells as well as low B cells. Over on the right is the switched memory B cell count, or SMB. Switched memory B cells are the most mature B cell that we can measure in peripheral blood. So before those cells go back to the bone marrow and become plasma cells, this is what we're quantitating. And I really wanted to show these data because you can easily see that there are two clumps of patients. So there are folks in the normal range, and there's clearly folks that just don't have any switched memory B cells. And because these are the cells that go on to become plasma cells and make antibody, this is thought to be functionally significant. And it's one of the characteristic features of antibody deficient patients. So it's a small subset, but definitely a subset. So what is going on with the antibodies? Well, here we had a lot more data to look at. So here we've got IgG levels. So that's the total antibody in the blood. And IgG is really the mechanism by which we have immunologic memory. So I have chickenpox antibodies, even though it's been decades and decades and decades since I've had chickenpox. And those plasma cells will continue to churn out antivaricella antibodies. So IgG is our immunologic memory and our protection from catching the same thing more than once. IgA is the antibody that protects our mucous membranes. And here is where things start to get interesting. Again, notice that there's really two discrete clumps of patients. There are folks who have normal IgA levels, and then there's definitely a subset of patients at the very bottom that make no IgA. And I'll say more about this in a minute. <clears throat> Similarly for IgM. So IgM doesn't have a discrete function, but it's sort of the trainer antibody that gets made before any other antibody. And having a low IgM is characteristic of immune dysfunction, although it doesn't have functional consequences. And again, notice that while you're not seeing the discrete populations as easily, there's definitely folks who have a low IgM. So I did a chart extraction on some of these patients. So I pulled the folks who had really low switch memory B cells over two years of age because it is an age-dependent 
um, cell type. There were 11 that fulfilled those criteria. Five had no clear mitochondrial disease. The three single gene defects that I've shown there, GABRG2, RARB, and MICU1, as well as a patient with Smith-McGinnis syndrome, which is known to be associated with uh, poor immunoglobulins. And then two had no identified gene, but had biopsies that were strongly, biopsies or um, complex one through four analysis that were strongly suggestive of mitochondrial disease. So clearly, diverse genetic etiologies. What about that low IgA group? So again, I found eight different patients that fulfilled pretty strict criteria. Three had no clear mitochondrial disease. This did overlap with the low switch memory B cell group. The MICU1 patient, it's the same MICU1 patient. In addition, there was a patient with a large deletion and a patient with an unclear diagnosis but abnormal enzymes who was still being worked up. So how does this help us? Well, we do treat these patients with immunoglobulin replacement, and I have several patients that we have started immunoglobulin with improvement in their infection profile. So we do think there's just a clinical benefit in identifying these patients, but I think it also speaks to the role of the mitochondria in the B cell, which has really been understudied. So to sum up, there's a relatively high rate of immunodeficiency in this cohort. The genetics are variable, and quite surprisingly, antibody deficiencies are more common than quantitative deficiencies of T cells. Definitely more work to do. And I uh, will end by saying thank you to the immunology group. These were not all my patients and the mitochondrial clinic that has invited me into their fold. And um, uh, Edward Shadalak for helping me uh, think about this. And then I will just end by offering to answer questions. Thank you so much.